right, I'm really excited to be here. I'm glad to see all of you here bright and early and eager and sitting in the front. I appreciate that. Can everyone hear me okay? Good, good, okay. I want to introduce you to someone. He's not here today with us in person, but he's here with us in spirit. And you might know him. He's, he's probably familiar to you. His name is George. Let's just pretend George is right here. Imaginary George. George is fed up. He's just had one of his employees screw up one of his best customers' projects. And George has spent hours trying to fix it. I'm coaching George, and he's hired me because he's got trouble with employees. He has more opportunity than he knows what to do with. He has business that he turns down because he doesn't have the employees that he needs to do the work. George turns to me and he says, Sabrina, what is wrong with this generation today? They don't want to work. I don't know what to do with them. May I don't know how to reach them. Maybe they're not reachable. George keeps asking me as to use my skills as a psychologist to help him squeeze out every drop of productivity from his warm body employees. And I have. I've coached George on how to coach. He's got great coaching skills. But his employees aren't coachable. That employee over there just got a DUI. George didn't fire him. George can't fire him because he's got skills. He's got a skill set that's valuable that George needs. So what George did was he took him off the truck he, that employee can't drive anymore, so now he always, he always has to go out with another tech. So now George has to send two people out at the same time. And the guy has really good skills when he shows up for work. George says to me, when we have the conversation about, George, you need to fire these folks, George says to me, Sabrina, First off, they have families. They have a wife, they have kids. I feel bad for the families. I don't want these guys to be unemployed because what does it do to their families? But when we're really honest, when we get right down to it, George doesn't fire them because he knows he'll be doing the work. He'll be out there, again, back in the field day after day. And he's really relieved he only has to be in the field now about 40 hours a week as opposed to 80. We've just looked at George's financials again. He's barely breaking even. And this has gone on year after year after year. And no surprise, George's payroll is one of his biggest expenses. But that's only part of the story. Because you remember the employee who screwed up the customer's project for George? That employee also screwed up $4,000 worth of materials. George had to eat the cost of those materials. And then George had to pay another employee overtime to go out with George to fix the project. And this isn't a one-time thing. George tells me this happens several times a year, if not more, in his business. That's money going out the door, down the drain in George's business. This is why George is struggling so hard to be profitable. When George hired me to coach him, he didn't hire me to coach him to be more profitable, even though I've told him, I can help you with this, George. What he wants most from me is to help him be happy again. He used to love what he does. He, his favorite thing is to fix things for people. He loves helping his customers. He's working around the clock. His stress level is through the roof. His wife is fed up with him because he works late evenings. He's hardly ever home on the weekend. When he is home, he's zoning out in front of the TV. He knows he should exercise more. He's got high blood pressure. He's eating terribly. He wants me to help him with work-life balance. But this is not a work-life balance issue. George really would like to take a vacation. He really would like to work less. 
he doesn't have the people that he needs. And so we go round and round in our coaching. I'm trying to get him to fire these people, and he just won't do it. And then he says to me, the phrase that I heard over and over from one business owner to another, Sabrina, this is a small town. We're in a rural area. You just can't get good help around here. All the good employees leave. All the good people move out, go to bigger towns. We're stuck. We've got to just make do with the situation. And then the phrase, it's just the way it is. And I heard it over and over. And for a long time, I bought into that. But all along, this little voice inside of me kept saying, what if it's not true? What if it's not true that because we're in a small town, a rural area, we can't get good employees in our small businesses? What if this is just a belief that all of us small business owners are buying into, acting as if it's true, and making it true, like a self-fulfilling prophecy? And with those questions, my book was born. Where are the second? How to Hire the Best, The Rural Business Owner's Ultimate Guide to Attracting Top Performing Employees. Now, how I came to write this book, it was really hard to write this book. I had an idea that somewhere there must be successful small business owners who have top performing employees in their businesses. Somewhere, there, there, there must be some. So I set out to find those folks, and they're not hard to find. But they were not willing to be interviewed. And they're all nice people, very friendly. It's not that they were standoffish and rude. What they said to me when I would ask them, can I interview you? Do you have a couple of good employees? I'd like to interview, I'd like to know what you know to attract those employees to your business. And time and again, they said to me, I can't tell you how I got those employees. It was luck, Sabrina. And I'm so thankful I have them. I hope they don't ever leave. And I need to know myself how to hire top performing employees, because every time I hire, it's a crapshoot. And if you go out and you find some answers to this problem, please come back and tell me, because I don't have the solutions. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, man. But one thing I know from coaching business owners all these years that I've been doing this, is that luck is never an accident. And I was convinced that if I could just get these small business owners to talk to me about their luck with their top performing employees that they had in their business, that maybe there would be some answers to this problem in their experiences. And when I would, what I would say is, look, I know you don't have the answers, I don't have the answers either, but maybe you know something, and maybe another business owner down the street knows something, and if I can pull all of that together, maybe we'll find some systems and strategies that small business owners everywhere can use to hire top performing employees in their business. And when I said that, that put them at ease, and then they would agree to be interviewed for the book. And I would ask them questions about their luck. Now, one of the strategies that I've used in coaching small business owners to help them improve their businesses, and I've done this from day one, is every time a client comes to a meeting or a phone call with me, I'll ask the first question out of my mouth, what are your wins and successes? They hate this question. We're not used to talking about wins and successes. And as small business owners, we have a survival strategy because we're wearing so many hats, right? Day after day, we're switching hats 30, 40 times a day doing different roles in our businesses, filling in the gaps, running around putting out one fire after another. It's our survival strategy to focus on the problems in our business. And when something is working, we say, oh, thank goodness, I'm glad that's working. I can put that on the back burner. It doesn't need my attention right now. I hope it keeps working. The problem with that is that when we are focused on our weed patch of problems, guess what's growing? Our weed patch of problems. What we focus on grows. When we focus on wins and successes, what grows? Come on now. Wins and successes. You guys are bright this early this morning. Wins and successes. 
And so what I've done all these years with these small business owners is when they ta start talking to me about their wins and successes, I'm listening for what's working in their business. What, what can we leverage from what's working and what systems can we create in that business to get more of that little seed that's working to grow into something much bigger in their business, to grow those wins and successes. And that strategy has worked remarkably well and that's that same strategy that I used when I would go out and talk to these small business owners about their top performing employees. And I would listen for the wins and successes. And those wins and successes can be turned into systems and strategies. Those systems and strategies are what's in my book, How to Hire the Best. Now, I'm going to talk to you a lot today about new ways to think about hiring, new ways to attract top performing employees, to get you doing things differently than you've ever done them before. But before we go there, I need to give you a new framework to think about the situation that we're in. I grew up here in central Louisiana, went to LSUA, went to LSU Shreveport, got my uh, bachelor's in psychology, went off to the University of Texas at Austin, it was in my early 20s when I went to graduate school. I don't know if you've ever sat in a room and felt so intimidated by the people around you, but here's 20-year-old Sabrina, bright and eager, and there are people, I'm in this room with 13 or 14 other graduate students. They've all worked, they've had careers, they're coming back, they have master's degrees. I went into a program that didn't require a master's degree to get in, so I went straight from my bachelor's into this doctoral program. They had master's degrees, some of them had been in private practice. I was thinking, oh my gosh, what did I just get myself into? I'll never forget the first class. The professor stands up and he starts talking about this concept, hermeneutics. And I'd never heard of it before. And everybody in the room nodded along like they knew what the heck this guy was talking about. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. I learned a lot of new concepts when I was in graduate school. I got introduced to a lot of new ideas. Hermeneutics was one of them, and I still to this day can't really tell you if I had to explain what hermeneutics is. Ah. But thankfully that has nothing to do with what I'm talking to you about. But one of the concepts that was totally mind-blowing for me, that has, I've carried it with me for years, is the concept of dominant discourse. Has anybody in here ever heard of dominant discourse? Okay, good. I wasn't alone in the room when the professor brought that concept up. Um, Dominant discourse. A discourse is a way of speaking and thinking about a topic that's prevalent within a society. Dominant discourse is a paradigm that we view our lives through, that we interpret what happens to us through this dominant discourse. And it's so much in the background of our thinking that we don't even recognize it's there. It's just, it just guides our actions, it guides our thoughts, it guides our beliefs. And dominant discourse can be helpful. It's a shorthand to understanding. But the problem with dominant discourse is that it can become so ingrained within a society that few people ever challenge the norm. It just becomes the way it is. That's just the way it is. So an example of dominant discourse is the wage gap between women and men. Years ago, when that was noticed, when it was noticed that, oh, this woman is making 80 cents on the dollar that, that her male coworker is making, the response was, ah, that's just the way it is. Dominant discourse. Well, someone, a, a lot of someones, got to talking about it and said, you know what, that's not just the way it is. And an alternate discourse emerged from that. The problem with dominant discourse is that it may or may not be true. But it can become so fixed in our mindsets that we just act as if it's true. And we fail to notice exceptions. And that's what stuck with me all these years, is that when, when we see something and we say that's just the way it is, we need to sit up, Pay attention, that phrase is a red flag, there's a dominant discourse going on, there's probably exceptions, and we need to notice what those exceptions are. 
We small business owners have a dominant discourse when it comes to employees. What, I'd love to hear from you guys what some of those examples might be. What do you think are some examples of our dominant discourse when we talk about employees? I'll, get, I'll, throw, I'll throw out an idea. What's wrong with this generation? They just don't want to work. All the good ones leave. Any others? Come on. I know you, I, you guys are talking about these things but amongst yourselves before the group meeting, before we get in here. Um, another one, I can't compete with larger companies to pay the wages that they pay, so I can't get the good employees. And that's the reason we can't get the employees that we need. Yeah. Those beliefs all, be all lead to one conclusion, and it is a very detrimental conclusion for us small business owners. And that conclusion is, I better hang on to every warm body that I've got in my business because I don't want to be the one doing all the work again. That belief is, is horrible for us as small business owners. Hanging on to warm bodies in your small business is the slow kiss of death. You just can't afford it. So I'm going to introduce you to a concept here that will help you see exactly what this is costing you. We talk about payroll, and sometimes we talk about employees and payroll like they're an investment on our good days, right? Having good employees, that's an investment in our business, and we want, we want to invest in our employees. But oftentimes, payroll is an expense, and it's only an expense, and there's no investment going on there. What's the difference between an expense and an investment. Can anybody tell me? The return. the return. So with an investment, you expect to put money out and have more money coming your way. Ideally, a lot more money coming your way. And when we're talking about employees, we would like to pay them and have their productivity exceed what we're paying them so that they really are an investment. I do a lot with my clients around turning the, every role that you have in your business into a profit center. And you're going to hear me talk about this later on today. Before you hire, you need to know how to turn that position into a profit center. How is somebody in that role in your business going to make you money or save you money? Because there's, there's only two ways to be profitable, right? I've got an accountant in the room. Two ways? There's not four, just two. Make money, save money. Make money, spend less. That's, that's how all there is. The problem with these warm bodies on our payroll is that they turn our payroll into an expense, not an investment, and they're very costly. I'm going to talk to you about warm bodies using the engagement matrix. There's a lot of research out there about how much employee disengagement costs business owners nationwide, but hardly anybody talks about, well, what does that mean for the everyday small business owner, you sitting here in this room? How much does it cost you this year? How much does it cost me this year? I want to help you think through what it really costs you. But on a nationwide basis, there's an estimate that employee disengagement and ineffectiveness costs U.S. businesses $588 billion dollars annually. It's unfathomable, that amount. It's huge. I can't wrap my head around it. Unhappy, disengaged employees spend only about 40% of their time on task. So in other words, they're showing up to work with you five days a week. You're getting two days of work out of them. So your payroll 
is a cost. It's like money going out the door at that point. Most companies, big companies, small businesses, doesn't matter, most companies have as much as 85% of their human resources doing just enough to get by. So when we say, wow, it feels like I have a lot of warm bodies in my business, most likely you do. And, and you're not any different from most businesses out there. So that's the good news. You're not alone in this by any means. There's, there's nothing that you're doing wrong, okay? Actually, you're doing everything that you've been taught to do, and that's why you have so many warm bodies on your payroll. Our hiring, traditional hiring practices are setting us up to fail. And I'll be telling you more about that in a little bit today. Back to the engagement matrix. Employees, every employee in your business can fall into one of these four quadrants of engagement. So the first quadrant is the engaged and ineffective quadrant. These are your new hires. Most of them start out excited, they're motivated, pumped up, ready to come to work for you, but they're ineffective. They don't even know where the bathroom is yet, much less how to make you money. So it takes them a while to get up to speed. The next quadrant is the engaged and effective quadrant. This is where most leadership training focuses, how to get your employees into this quadrant. And you want to get your new hires up to speed as quickly as possible and move them from engaged and ineffective to engaged and effective. These are the employees who produce for you at, with discretionary effort that you couldn't even afford to pay for if you wanted to. They are highly productive, they're good problem solvers, they're motivated, they have been with you long enough to understand what you do. Their ideas are meaningful. The, the challenge with the engaged and ineffective employees, they're really great to have in your business because they come in and they come in with fresh eyes and they, they see things that you can be doing different and better, but the problem is, is they're so unfamiliar with your company and what you're doing and maybe totally new to your industry that their suggestions may be completely irrelevant to the sweet spot, the focus of your business. So you may not be able to do much with their suggestions. But these employees will probably have really good suggestions, these engaged and effective employees. Now over here, down here, we have the disengaged and effective employees. I spend a lot of time coaching business owners about what to do with these folks. These folks are the ones that used to be really good. They used to do good work for you, but something has happened, and who knows what. Maybe they're going through a difficulty in their personal life, or maybe you looked at them wrong one day. Or, or one issue that I hear a lot is, I think they're jealous of me as the owner and the, the privileges that I have, like when I get to travel or be away from the office, they don't realize I'm working, so I think they're jealous of me even when I'm off at home, they don't realize I'm still working. Um, but they, they cause a lot of strife in the company because when you roll out new initiatives, they roll their eyes or they grumble in the back of the room, and because they've been with the business so long, the other employees kind of look to them as leaders in the company, right? And so it, they feed into, those other employees feed into this problem and you get a lot of drama on your hands. We say they're retired at most. Exactly, exactly. They're a warm body. And you may even have some of these folks who do really good work but then they do something that just makes you cringe. Like some way that they do something just makes you, oh, oh, I can't believe they did that again. Over here we have the disengaged and ineffective employees. These folks, it's pretty easy to know what to do with them. They, they are warm bodies, they're just showing up collecting a paycheck, they're waiting to be told what to do. They make a lot of mistakes. You try to coach them. They nod their head and they say, oh yeah, I can do that. And the next day, they're back to the old ways. Nothing changes. Now, <clears throat> I wanna walk you through an exercise and you have a handout for calculating the cost of employee disengagement and effectiveness. Go to page two of your handout. And look at step one. I want to give you the chance to think about each of your employees 
and assign each employee in your business to one of the four quadrants.